All right, listen up. Shh. Let's get focused. Focus. Okay, yesterday under Black Power, after the assassination of Malcolm X, Sadie, who became the young black radical leader that took his spot? Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. In 1966, after the assassination of Malcolm X, who basically took his spot for the black power movement? Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael. And he was quoted as once saying, we've been saying freedom for six years and we ain't got nothing. What we're going to start saying is black power. And that's really where the black power movement came from. Now, we have some movement on whether we're going to stay with Martin Luther King's philosophy, which we'll talk about later, or we're going to move towards the more radical civil rights movement. And I told you yesterday, in 1967, one single event pushed African Americans more towards the new philosophy of civil rights than the old philosophy of civil rights. And this is the event that happened. So just, just keep it on the, don't, 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 don't go to the back. Just keep the picture of the front. Don't look at the back, look at the back quite yet. He gets hit by a car on the bottom with me. You, he was wishing he had to do it. Okay, listen up. This is the event I'm talking about. Yes. All right, quiet please, and now turn to the other side. 1967, welcome to Mississippi. There had been thunder when they last met. James Meredith and Ole Miss, fall of 1962. Meredith becomes the first black person to enter the University of Mississippi, a bold-fisted challenge to discriminatory admissions policies in America's colleges. Meredith's challenge meets a rage of resistance, rioting, killings, so much so that Meredith is under constant federal guard during his time at the university. With his graduation in 1963, the two-year duel lapses, but Mississippi would remember. June 6, 1967, Meredith is coming home after time in Africa and New York's Columbia Law School. Home to Mississippi, on foot, walking alone and unarmed through some of the most remote and racially unsettled counties in the state. It is a 220-mile stretch from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. He is making his... He is making his Solitary journey to promote black voter registration to combat the fears blacks feel about living and traveling freely in Mississippi. My objective was to expose the all-persuasive fear that existed. You had a million blacks in Mississippi, 12,000 registered to vote. Now this was two years after Johnson had signed the voting rights bill, but still no one had registered to vote. Even though Johnson had signed a bill saying that blacks have the right to vote and all they do was go and sign the book, most blacks still didn't sign the book. Now, it wasn't because they didn't want to, it was because they were afraid of the consequences. They didn't know what would happen. Before, when they tried to push the point, someone would come on the courthouse lawn and shoot them. They didn't know for sure whether there would be the same consequences. The question was, had we changed or hadn't we changed? Memphis, only 12 miles from Mississippi and once a giant kingpin of the Cotton Empire, is the starting point. People are attracted to his mission. A black soldier, a Memphis businessman, a minister from the New York spontaneously take up the march with him, all on the basis of an inspiring chance meeting. Meredith is a compelling figure, helmeted, carrying an ebony and ivory walking stick, a gift from an African tribal chieftain. He walks past the hopeful, hopeful and the hate-filled. Occasional groups of blacks dot the roadside with quiet support and prayers, even as cars full of angry whites dog him along Highway 51, wildly swerving in his direction. It's a continual intimidation. Threats of blind anger pour out. I hope to hell you die before you get there. He walks on. It is a hot, sultry afternoon. The heat shimmers above the steamy asphalt highway. Photographer Jack Thornell is covering the march for the Associated Press. 
Quote, we were leapfrogging with our cars, just staying a little ahead of him. From the bushes, a man's voice speaks quietly. James, James, I only want James Meredith. Meredith turns towards the voice in the bushes and gunshot ricochets along the road. The other marchers sprawl out on the highway. What alerted us was the first shot. I think it was a warning shot to scare everyone else away. I hopped out of the car and started taking pictures. Now, two successive blasts shatter the stillness. Meredith falls, writhing, writhing on the asphalt. From the brush skirting Highway 51, a man is apprehended, whom neighbors describe as a, quote, very nice man, as nice a neighbor as you could ask for. Meredith is rushed to a Memphis hospital. Emergency surgery will carve 60 shotgun pellets from his head, neck, back, and legs. For his deadly assault on James Meredith, Aubrey James Norbell will spend 18 months in jail. Dr. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, Dick Gregory, and other black leaders continue the march. By the time they get to Jackson, they are 18,000 strong. The march will give rise to a new phrase, black power. Now turn your picture over, and you can see Norvell in the bushes after he has shot James Meredith. Now, folks, that was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. And that was one event that really turned people from the peaceful demonstration to violence. So, yes. Why instead of helping him, he took the picture? Shh, kids, why I can't instead hear. of helping him, he took the picture of the guy crying? In the well, it happened so fast that he got plenty of help afterwards. But yeah, he was filming it for the Associated Press. Yeah. Caitlin, I can't. You're too pretty to look at your back. I'm sorry. You go yeah. There? No yeah. problem. Okay, now. Again, this incident that involved James Meredith provoked many black leaders to start to support the philosophy of Malcolm X rather than the philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. And this incident also led to the formation of a new organization, the Black Panthers, which was a very militant organization. And you see an example of that on Forrest Gump when, if you've ever watched that. Okay? So this incident with James Meredith led to the formation of a militant organization called the Black Panthers. And it was an organization of militant radical blacks. Yep, the incident involving James Meredith led to the formation of the Black Panthers organization. And they were a militant organization. They were not into non-violence. They were quite into violence. Now, this group was founded in Oakland, California, and it was led by two people, Huey Newton and Bobby Seal. Huey Newton and Bobby Seal, who if you watch Forrest Gump are also mentioned. Wait, what was the so the Black Panthers were a radical, violent group founded in Oakland, California, and they were led by Huey Newton and Bobby Seal. So again, this incident involving James Meredith led to the formation of the Black Panthers organization, which was a radical, violent group founded in Oakland, California, led by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. Now, Newton once made the comment, political power comes through the barrel of a gun. That was his philosophy. Political power comes through the barrel of a gun. Now, when you talked about the black power issue, which group was most publicized in the country? Panthers. The Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. Okay, very clear. Now, we're going to end this test material, or quiz material, with our last subtopic, and it's very important you understand this, because you will be on your test without question. And that is the difference between Martin Luther King Jr. and black power. So I'm going to give you a comparison of the views of Martin Luther King Jr. concerning civil rights and the new black power philosophy of civil rights. And I'm going to give you four examples. Martin Luther King Jr. versus black power. What were the differences in philosophy? Number one, Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in a non-violent approach to civil rights. Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in a non 
violent approach to civil rights, while the black power movement believed in armed self-defense. That's number one. Martin Luther King Jr. believed in a non-violence approach to civil rights. The black power movement believed in armed self-defense. That's number one. Again, Martin Luther King Jr. believed in a non-violent approach to civil rights. The black power movement believed in armed self-defense. Number two. Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in the integration of blacks and whites. Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in the integration of blacks and whites. What do you think the black power movement believed in? Separation. Total separation of blacks and whites. So number two, Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in the integration, integration of blacks and whites. The black power movement believed in total separation of blacks and whites. So what is that? Like they, just each other they would be all for segregated schools. They would be all for blacks they, over here and whites over here. But they just wanted to treat just like equal. Well, this got to be so. radical, so it, it's a little different philosophy. They're, they're getting pissed, so and they're going to deal with it. So how come in forest come there's that white guy? Yeah, the white guy and Jenny. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a spook. I mean, yeah, we'll watch it and I'll explain it at the time. Okay, number three, the third comparison. Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in working with the system. Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in working with the system. The black power movement believed in preparing for revolution. So Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in working with the system. The black power movement believed in preparing for revolution. What is revolution? When you revolt against the system. So again, Martin Luther King Jr. believed in working with the system. The black power movement believed in preparing for revolution. And the fourth and probably most common one to understand is Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers believed in including white people in the civil rights movement. We've told you about the, the civil rights movement, the Freedom Riders, and those people weren't just black people, they were black and white people that were civil rights advocates. So Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy believed in including white people in the civil rights movement, whereas black power believed in excluding white people from the civil rights movement. So again, Martin Luther King Jr. believed in including The black power movement excluding. We're going to read this a little bit here before we continue. This was from the Billings Gazette in Montana in 1999. I'm party like it's 1990. And all of a sudden now it's 2014. Okay, let's read through this. Malcolm X's bloody diary for sale, family wants it back. The bloodied, bullet riddled diary of Malcolm X, which was in his coat pocket when he was assassinated, is going up for auction. But his family insists that they insist that they that, that's not, that isn't even done right, is it? Yeah, but his family insists that they are the rightful owner of the 146 pages once used as evidence in the trial of the men convicted of killing the black Muslim leader. This should go back to the family. Kenneth Cobb, director of New York's Municipal Archives, said on Saturday, this is the personal property of Malcolm X. The red mock leather booklet was People's Exhibit 60 at the trial of the three men found guilty in Malcolm X's killing on February 21, 1965 in a Harlem ballroom. An auction house in San Francisco, Butterfield and Butterfield, wow, is to sell the diary on May 27th for possibly as much as $50,000. Marred by three bullet holes and blood stains, it contains phone numbers of Malcolm's friends and associates, other personal notes, and his schedule on days he never lived to see. 
New York City officials are investigating how the item got into the hands of a private collector who then sold it to the current owner, reportedly a New York resident. The archives took possession of Malcolm X's case files from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in 1993. Officials said the personal effects of a murder victim usually are returned to family members, police inspector Michael Collins told the New York Times. Joseph Fleming, who represents the estate of the late Betty Shazbaugh, Malcolm's widow, told the newspaper that the family, including Malcolm's daughter, Elijah Chavez, is shocked that something that represents so intimate a part of their father's last moments would find its way to the auction house on the West Coast. The auction house released a one-line statement Saturday saying it does not believe and has not said we believe the address book of Malcolm X was sold by the New York Police Department. Officials did not know, however, how the previous owner obtained the book. How'd they get the book in there? The police department sold it to somebody, right? So anyway, it's amazing what things are worth, 1999, 50,000. Is that okay. around somewhere, like, you know? I don't know, that'd be good. I gotta, be, I gotta go to my office, I forgot something, I'll be right back. So just hang tight.